Good morning and thank you so much for getting up with us on this Saturday morning. I'm Galen Etlin. The time is six o'clock and this morning some new COVID restrictions are in effect along the Oregon coast. We're going to hear from some businesses changing up how they're serving customers to stay afloat and meet the new Pac-12 champs. A bizarre season ends with a U of O victory. More about the Ducks big win against the Trojans. But first, our Chris McGinnis is live at home with your forecast. And Chris, we are in for a wet weekend. Yeah, we certainly are, and not necessarily this morning. So if you've got some stuff you want to get done outside and you want to avoid the rain, the morning hours today is your best bet. Radar right now showing generally a clean sweep up the I-5 corridor, maybe a sprinkle or two in the Cascades, and you do see some rain offshore. That will be building inland a bit later today, but for now, we are dry, and that's about the only dry time we're going to manage this weekend. It's 50. It's very mild. Last check at PDX. 49 right now, Beaverton, 49 Hillsboro, and the big picture across the state. Nobody uh, terribly cold west of the Cascades, and even eastern Oregon, uh, you know, 30 in Baker City, 19 in Burns. Not bad for late December. We have been and can certainly be much colder than that. All of us will be warming into the 50s, we think, this afternoon, and the rain ratchets up, uh, if not by lunchtime, shortly thereafter, and it turns a little breezy as well. Galen, here's a snapshot of Futurecast. Whoops, we just blew right past it. Uh, we've got the rain ratcheting up a little bit later this afternoon, and we will also see and feel some gusty winds at the coast. There's a flood watch in effect for most of western Oregon starting later today. I'll break that down in more detail, let you know how much rain we're going to get, when, where, how much, all that stuff coming up in just a few minutes. Lots going on, Chris. Thank you so much for the update. Oregon hit a grim milestone of 100,000 COVID cases yesterday. The first case in the state was reported 10 months ago. Now, of those 100,000 cases, more than a quarter were reported this month alone. The two-week average is that dotted blue line here. It appears to be leveling off, but it is still at almost 1,500 cases a day. Now, county risk levels around the state have been updated based on viral spread, and Oregon's coastal counties are now on the growing list of those dubbed extreme risk by the governor. So that means some big changes for restaurants, including no more indoor dining there. Our Catherine Cook breaks it all down. In Cannon Beach, people here are used to the ocean's ebb and flow. It's the ups and downs of their livelihood that they're grappling with. The changes that occur, they happen, it seems so fast and frequently. The latest change means no indoor dining for any restaurants along the Oregon coast for at least two weeks beginning Friday. That goes for all counties in the red after the governor declared them at extreme risk for COVID-19. It's a little brutal. Jordan Meyer is general manager at Driftwood Restaurant and Lounge. These photos show how they've gone from offering limited indoor seating to lining up tables for a to-go order assembly line. You know, people see all these tables, especially when it's really stormy out and they want to come in and eat. And, you know, we're a tourist town and when, every, when the restaurants are closed, hotel business goes down and it's going to impact everybody on the coast here. Definitely feels... Uh pretty quiet here in town. <laughs> yeah. Jenny Becker and her daughter Emily run B Boutique in Cannon Beach. They're bracing for the impact that limited restaurant business might have on their store. Our hotels, restaurants, and retail spaces um, are what drive our re little resort community. So it's really um, going to show up in the next few days, I think. After closing temporarily back in March, the Beckers moved their store online okay. within a week. I'm going to do $25. Virtual $25. fashion shows, sales, $25. and new arrivals have also made up for lost foot traffic. They've kept all of it going and even reduced store hours, knowing days like this would come. It inspired us to think outside the box mm -hmm. because we were like, we want to stay in business, we want to keep our clients and that joy that we give to people. So we're like, okay, what are we going to do? It's unclear how long these freezes will last. Oregon just hit 100,000 cases of COVID-19. And while the vaccine gives everyone here hope, their reality remains an ebb and flow of uncertainty. It's, it's all taking a hit, but try to keep your head up and try to keep moving forward. Catherine Cook, KGW News. All right, we do have some good news, though, in the vaccine front. The FDA has granted emergency use authorization to Moderna. The company will start sending shots to medical centers across the country. Now, Moderna's vaccine is shown to be about as effective as Pfizer's, but unlike Pfizer's vaccine, Moderna's does not need to be stored at ultra-cold temperatures in fancy refrigerators. Shipping logistics will be easier, and more rural hospitals without that technology can handle it. 
President Trump, meanwhile, has signed a stopgap spending measure to keep the government from shutting down, at least through tomorrow night. Lawmakers are trying to buy more time as they try to finalize a long-term spending bill, complete with a $900 billion coronavirus relief package. But right now, they're stuck battling over emergency Federal Reserve spending powers. The package is expected to include more than $300 billion in aid for businesses, enhanced unemployment benefits, and direct stimulus checks of about $600. Some families are calling on Oregon schools to reopen. They even protested outside the governor's mansion in Salem yesterday. And they're worried about their kids falling too far behind, and they say that they need to be in class with their teachers and friends. Look at these kids. I mean, really, look at these kids. Yeah. These kids are suffering. These kids are really suffering. Um, not just educationally, which is huge, but more emotionally, mentally, socially, now, the head of Oregon's Department of Education says the state is constantly reevaluating metrics for reopening schools and changes could be on the way. He cited some new data showing schools have not contributed significantly to the spread of COVID-19 in other areas. We'll let you know what the state decides. All right, we've got an update now on the Red House standoff in North Portland. The family at the center of it all, the Kinneys, say they've been in touch with the mayor's office every day this week trying to find a resolution. For weeks now, demonstrators have barricaded themselves at the property on Mississippi Avenue to stop the Kinney family's eviction and to keep police away. We all share the common goal of making sure the Kinney family uh, maintains their home. And so uh, we have all agreed to coming up with a peaceful diplomatic resolution. And right now we're still in the infancy of uh, these negotiations. Now, the developer who bought the Kinney's home at auction told KGW last week he'd be willing to sell it back to them at price. But the family says they've had no communication with him so far. We're going to continue to follow this story, and it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of layers and background to it. You can find more information on KGW.com to catch up. Now, as we near the end of 2020, gun violence in Portland is getting worse. As of this weekend, Portland police say they've responded to 858 shootings. In 2020, Portland has seen the most homicides in 27 years. And KGW's Pat Doris has one police sergeant's reaction to the ongoing violence. This shooting near Emanuel Hospital Thursday night left a woman dead, murdered in front of her husband, according to the district attorney. She became the 52nd homicide in Portland this year. It's the most in the city in 27 years, each more than just a number. This week alone, five people were killed, including a 16-year-old and a 44-year-old named Mike Arthur. He was working at the Cured Green Shop on North Lombard when he was robbed. His brother Lorne still trying to understand why he was killed. If they had asked Mike, he would have done everything he could to be able to help him. Like, he's not someone you need to take from if you need. He's he has spent his whole life giving to the community. Gunfire in Portland is now common. In 2020, 52 homicides with 224 people shot and 858 separate shootings. It's shocking. It's not just, you know, in all the years that I, I worked, uh, you know, in units that tried to reduce gun violence, there would always be spikes. Uh, this is an astronomical spike. Sergeant Kenneth Dulio spent the last 19 years working with Portland specialty teams that targeted gun violence. The team was disbanded at the beginning of July. Activists accused it of unfairly targeting people of color, a charge that Police Chief Chuck Lavelle, a black man with deep ties to Portland, said was not accurate. Still, the team was defunded during the summer's racial protests. The cops in the unit scattered to other duties. Dulio thinks it's a big reason why there are so many shootings now. So right now, I think, you know, some of these people that are involved in gun violence, they're kind of rolling around the city looking for their enemies, and there's really no consequences. They're not really, you know, afraid that the police are going to stop them, that they might get arrested, they might get caught with a gun, and so they just kind of got a free pass. Crime scenes in the past might hold bullet casings for 20 to 30 rounds, DeLeo said. Now it's common for police to find 50, 60, even more. Sometimes, you know, it is a shootout between two different groups. And there might be three or four shooters on one side and three or four shooters on the other side. And, you know, potentially just with the sheer number of shots fired, you know, somebody's likely to get hit. And unfortunately, sometimes as innocent people, too. Last weekend, a 23-year-old from Iraq driving for Uber stopped to pick up a ride in the Woodland neighborhood. 
and got caught in the crossfire of at least 60 bullets. He later died at the hospital. Sergeant DeLeo said nearly all the gang-related shootings are connected, retaliation or payback for a past shooting. They're all connected. And some of these connections don't just go back like for a few weeks or a few months, but they go back years and years. The question of how to stop the shootings is not an easy one. While some, like Sergeant Dulio, want the specialty team put back together, it's currently disbanded, and the police bureau's budget has been cut by millions. The mayor's been all over the board on this. First, he supported disbanding that unit. Then he said maybe it should be brought back. And in the meantime, the shootings continue. In Northeast Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. Now, the mayor and police chief announced starting immediately, more detectives will be assigned to investigate and follow up on those shootings. The city is also reaching out to other law enforcement agencies for support. Still to come here, we ride with Engine 72, an all-female team of first responders answering calls in Gresham. We'll be right back.